Hello, I'm Arthur White with Detroit Opera and welcome to today's panel discussion. In just a few weeks, uh, Detroit Opera will open a brand new production of Anthony and Tulani Davis's opera X, The Life and Times of Malcolm X. The celebrated playwright and director Robert O'Hara is set to direct his first opera with X and has indicated he will introduce elements of Afrofuturism into the production. And so this seemed to be a great time to bring a distinguished panel to help explain and give some context to this movement. Uh, we welcome Miss Ingrid Lafleur as a globally recognized curator, design innovationist, and Afrofuturist committed to exploring and implementing forward-thinking solutions across multidisciplinary industries. She's also a native Detroiter. Mr. Devon Tynes is a path-breaking artist whose work not only encompasses a diverse repertoire, but it also explores the social issues of our day. Named Musical America's 2022 Vocalist of the Year, he is also Detroit Opera's artist in residence and will be taking up the title role of X in the life and times of Malcolm X. Our moderator, Professor Naomi Andre, she is professor in women's studies, the Department of Afro-American and African Studies, and the Residential College Arts and Ideas in the Humanities Program at the University of Michigan. She's also inaugural scholar in residence at the Seattle Opera. Among her published works include the book Black Opera, History, Power, and Engagement. Uh, thank you all for being here, and thank you. Take it over, Naomi. <laughs> Thank you so much, Arthur, and everybody behind the scenes with um, Detroit Opera. It is such a pleasure for me to be here with such a warm and exciting group of people, Ingrid Lafleur and Devon Tynes. I'm going to start us out with just a few words to set, situate us, set us up with sort of what is Afrofuturism, and I put on my professor's hat some um, information just about opera and Afrofuturism just to situate the conversation. I'm going to share my screen and a working definition that I found online, and I kind of like it, though we can certainly talk and debate this further on um, and expand it in our panel. But just to get us on the same page, a working definition is a cultural movement that uses the frame of science fiction and fantasy to reimagine the history of the African diaspora and to invoke a vision of a technically advanced and generally hopeful future in which Black people thrive. I also want to mention a, another related movement I found online that is adjacent to Afrofuturism, and this is African Futurism, also called African Jujuism, which decenters the Western emphasis on Afrofutur that Afrofuturism implies and focuses on the African continent at the center from which the diaspora fans out. Let me um, talk just a few comments about what does this all mean or how can it mean? I think of Afrofuturism as a space of possibility. This is a space that encompasses time and I wanna talk about a structure of time that brings together the past, the future and our present. By acknowledging, embracing and learning from the past, we can endure, perhaps even thrive at times in the present and present a new age for the future. Such a present and future depend upon dealing with issues from the past, and I'm referring to slavery and its afterlives in Jim Crow, segregation, redlining, housing neighborhoods, separate and not equal realities that come out of a, a system of white supremacy. If we finally deal with these issues from the past, time in the future might be tethered to the past, but it will not be dictated and newly punished by the horrors of the past. Afrofuturism allows the present, our preparation for the future, to be a time of repair. Such repair is an intentional word, since I want to conjure the theme of reparations, but not focus on the monetary payment that is so frequently connected to discussions of reparations. My meaning of repair focuses on confronting harm, finding a way to acknowledge and heal from the horrors of the past as we move forward. 
I'd like to turn to a model of Afrofuturism in fiction, the science fiction, uh, science fiction and speculative fiction of writer, uh, award-winning writer Octavia Butler. In two of Octavia Butler's novels, The Parable of the Sower from 1993 and Parable of the Talents from 1998, the central character, Lauren Olamina, is cast as a prophet and her diaries that she writes out throughout the book outline a philosophy that she calls Earthseed. In the context of a dystopic world filled with capitalism gone awry and natural resources that have dried up, Lauren is searching and embracing change. And I just have to say that um, reading this, these novels, the first one from 1993, um, is a little... Um, unsettling today. She, uh, Octavia Butler dates them to uh, 2024 is when they start and they move forward through the 21st century, but it feels so um, uncannily uh, current. And it's not a surprise that during the pandemic, these books topped the New York Times bestsellers list. So Lauren is searching and embracing change and such change, such change comes out of the famous line from these novels, quote, all that you touch, you change. All that you change, changes you. In Butler's parable novels, Lauren and her followers seek to harness the energy that comes out of change so that they can create the space of possibility, a space that's pioneered in the world of Octavia Butler's novels, Acorn, the community that they built together. I think of Lauren Olamina's Acorn community as representing Black achievement, where there is a new way of living that is not based on the white patriarchal hierarchies or a feigned colorblindness that claims to be rooted in capitalism. Instead, such communities were pioneered in our real world as the Black Wall Street of the Greenwood District in Tulsa, Oklahoma, that was massacred and burned to the ground in 1921. Other such attempts at a Black-centered new beginning can be seen in Rosewood, Florida, that community that was built, burned in 1923. And even up to more recent times, we see incidents around the MOVE communal organization started by John Africa in 1972 in West Philadelphia. There was first a shootout in 78 and then a devastating bombing in 1985. To get to this space of possibility, I think of art as a spaceship. It can be a vehicle that can catapult us out of this current depression. It, the destination of this spaceship is that space of possibility I mentioned up front, yet now I wanna dig a little deeper. This is a place where black people are treated as fully human a place where Black folks do not need handouts or special treatment. It is a space where all of the people are part of the same whole, where the smartest and best people come from all racial and ethnic backgrounds. Art can help us think of these places, envision these landscapes, and hear the sonic uh, world of new possibilities. This ends my opening remarks, but it sets it up for our conversation with Devon Tynes and Ingrid Lafleur, who also have deep connections to this opera, Detroit, and these ideas around Afrofuturism. Hello, it's so nice to be here with you. And um, we're just at the start of rehearsals for X, The Life and Times of Malcolm X, which I'm so excited to dive more deeply into. And part of what I'm so excited about is realizing this concept that our wonderful director, Robert O'Hara, has of situating the opera within an Afrofuturist context. Now, this is a concept that's fairly new to me, but I do, I think, understand the initial idea and the root of it. But I'm really excited to speak further with with you, Naomi, and also Ingrid to illuminate, you know, how can an audience be connected to the possibility of this world of thinking? But just from where I am coming into it, um, you know, it seems that ideals, and I don't want to be too prescriptive before we really get <laughs> the real content of it, um, ideals of Afrofuturism, or at least imagining of a future, are a bit woven into how Malcolm X even um, spoke about some of his work. Robert O'Hara pulls on the quotes 
the future belongs to those who prepare for it today. And also armed with the knowledge of our past, we can confidently charter a course for our future. So that kind of thinking, um, that sort of rooted hope in what a future can be by engaging our current situation, um, it seems that Afrofuturism might be a place for that sort of thinking to be held and shared with other people, or at least a place for people to invite it, to be invited into that kind of thinking. And the work that I've been involved in um, most recently and care the most deeply about um, has to deal with engaging social issues. Um, I made a show called The Black Clown, which is a Langston Hughes poem that contextualizes a Black man's oppression within 300 years of American history so that one can uh, envision their own perseverance in spite of that history. Um, a piece called Were You There? That is a meditation on racist police brutality that asks audiences to hold the truth um, or more recent truths that can continue to persist as um, yeah, threat to, to Black life. And then also most recently, I had the wonderful opportunity to work with a violinist, Jennifer Coe, in a piece called Everything Rises that kind of shows the parallel lineages of um, Korean American history and also Black American history told through the stories of our mother figures and how there are congruencies and places of um, companionship within minority experiences um, of, of, different, of different contexts within America. One of my favorite collaborators and somebody I've learned from the most is the opera director, Peter Sellers. And um, a really formative thing that he shared with me early on in our working is that opera is a very special and unique place where you can invite people to sit together in the same physical space and hold a reality together that does not yet exist. And that is extremely exciting to me as a creator and a performer, because it means that my existence can be a part of helping people imagine what can be. So in making work that engages um, social issues or identity, it's really uh, my own opportunity to be a part of saying, where are we right now? How is that contextualized in where we have been? And as we sit together physically in space and hold that together, what can we then begin to imagine as the possibility of what we can walk towards and then understand as individuals how we can all contribute to making this imagined reality real. So taking on a role like Malcolm X um, is daunting for one, but also deeply exciting because it means that I, in some small way, get to be a part of a thread of bringing the reality that this incredible figure was trying to imagine to be able to help bring that to life. Um, with my residency here at Detroit Opera, it's kind of turned into my own meta preparation for the role in a way because I just wanted to come visit Detroit as much as I could over the past year. I came here about every month or five weeks for about a week and a half or so and got to know um, many different um, beautiful aspects of the Black um, arts community and also various social engagement leaders throughout Detroit. And just wanting to see what sort of collaboration could happen by meeting people organically over time, being inspired by the fact that X, I think, took relationship building and community uplift as the bedrock of what was possible, meaning if we could all find what our connections were as Black folk, <laughs> we could then move together in some sort of alignment toward a future that does not currently exist. So this idea of bringing into the present or even inspiring into the future work that has been, um, yeah, I, I don't I don't want to I don't want to be prescriptive because I want to learn from you Ingrid you know you <laughs> are are beautifully enveloped and seeped in this idea and word of afrofuturism and I would love the opportunity for you to let us know what is the best way to enter into and hold this concept so that we don't one diffuse it by applying it in ways that it perhaps does not um um, apply, but also a, a clarifying way for people to connect where we currently are through this way of thinking to how they engage any sort of work. Thank you so much for having me. Hello, Detroit. It's always a pleasure. Um, so thank you so much for that question, Devon. Uh, what I found uh, when I started curating Afrofuturism in Detroit, 
Uh, I made the mistake of thinking I was bringing Afrofuturism or the concept when in actuality, what is happening is that we're reminding people. We're basically helping to unlock the knowledge and wisdom that is already embodied within us. And in a way, Afrofuturism gives us permission to explore those parts of ourselves and to claim it and to move forward through that lens, if that makes sense. Um, because Afrofuturism is, uh, I like to think of it as a method of imagining. And that's what Afrofuturism is about, ultimately. Black people controlling their destiny through a narrative that they create, not what was created for us. And we're seeing um, that we are in popular culture, it's, it's happening more and more, that we're getting free of all the constraints so that we can create these new futures and reconnect with those past, near past, but also ancient past that give us wisdom to recontextualize our life. Um, we're not taught these things in school, so Afrofuturism helps to give us a platform to investigate them even further. And we cannot um, talk about Afrofuturism without talking about spiritual practices. This is a very central part of Afrofuturism. The spirituality of um, indigenous uh, Africa, uh, the spirituality within the West Indies um, and here in the United States that becomes <clears throat> that sometimes is influenced by US American indigenous uh, spirituality, African spirituality, um, with a mixture of sometimes Christ Christianity in the way that is reimagined for our own health and benefit. Um, the spiritual practices um, help to keep us balanced and centered so that we can imagine. You know, when I first came to Detroit, I wanted to teach children and I was just like, great, we get to like imagine together and travel to these new worlds. And it was important simply because Detroit was just struggling so much that it became a dystopian for them in their minds. So I wanted to kind of shift that. But the problem is that if you are dealing with a water shut off or you're going hungry, all of these social and economic challenges limit our ability to imagine. And if we do imagine, we might imagine a year out, five years out, maybe. Um, and you know, that then hinders our possibilities. Right, and so I, I came to understand that to have space to, to imagine is a privilege all into itself. Hence mm -hmm. the reason why I started working in um, emerging technology to look at ways to give us more space so that we can rest, so that we can dream, so that we can imagine and create new futures. Um, and this is what Malcolm X wanted for us. We are just continuing a legacy, right? Um, Adrian Marie Brown and Walida Amarisha uh, wrote, uh, co-edited, uh, excuse me, this book, uh, Octavia's Brood. And uh, with it, they basically asked social justice activists to uh, share stories and narratives. And the idea is that to be a social justice activist, you have to, automatically be a futurist. You are seeing a future, a possibility of a future, and you are working towards that. Regardless of the barriers, limitations, you're trying to push through all of that and you're strategizing in that process, right? Uh, and I love that. And so Malcolm X definitely was an Afrofuturist. And I, my favorite part actually of Malcolm X is when he went to Mecca and came back. Um, he shifted his vision of the future because of that trip and wanted to embark on a new journey. And unfortunately, he couldn't. But I think that we are, um, I think that, it, that his vision of this brotherhood, of the diversity where race isn't centered, where, um, where we can come together through love is happening. 
And it's definitely a similar experience of the brotherhood that he experienced. Um, and I did in that moment, I was like, this is the future or a high level of diversity where we respect and love each other's cultures. Um, but, and this is the last point, Afrofuturism does tackle anti-Blackness, which exists around the world. And it does help us to create a healthier relationship to Black bodies, a more loving one, and um, create new perspectives, uh, and which will change how we engage with each other. Uh, I do think that anti-Blackness is plaguing the world. It's one thing that we don't talk about enough. And if we want the futures, these just beautiful, pleasurable futures, we have to make sure that that goes away completely. Um, I, I thank you so much. And um, I, I really appreciate the A definition of Afrofuturism being a method of imagining. And I'm trying to think about that in the context of, you know, how this production will exist. So the general audience of opera is uh, a white audience of a certain context. And I'm wanting to think about, you know, this is a method of imagining how do we offer or say that this is a method of imagining for a Black audience to perhaps create new futures by connecting to past and also seeing what's possible, but also hold the import of that, that um, method of imagining for an audience that might not necessarily understand that it's critical for a, a Black audience to engage through that frame, you know, the prefix Afro. So of course, futurism exists. And maybe a broad, a broadly white audience would say, well, why can't we enter into this in a futurist way? And I want to, you know, make the case for, I'd love to understand what is the case for saying, no, it is, it is critical that this be thought of in an Afro-futurist way. So um, thank you for that question. Um, Afrofuturism is actually for everybody. Mm -hmm. This is a method just for black-bodied people. Um, this is for everyone. I, uh, Bryce Detroit is an Afrofuturist um, based in Detroit, and we um, co-hosted a conversation uh, some years back, and uh, <laughs> our audience was mainly white men. Uh, and I will just say most of my audiences tend to be majority white. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, he asked, like, why are, why are you here? Uh, and finally, one guy was brave enough to admit that he was raised with a lot of limiting beliefs, white supremacy in his mind, Catholicism, um, and other things. And so he was trying to find liberation, and he thought Afrofuturism was his path forward. The centering of Black bodies in your imagination is probably the most liberating thing you've ever done. Simply because anti-Blackness tells us not to, we're socialized not to. So, and I've given workshops and I've had white uh, students tell me that that was amazing and thank you. Um, the centering of Black bodies unapologetically, this is not up for conversation or discussion. If you want to center, uh, you know, other people, you go into other methods, you know, but this one, this lane, we're centering Black people, their desires, their dreams, their culture, um, their histories. Uh, so that we can create futures that aren't harmful and to imagine all of that. We're not considered in a lot of development of things. And we can see that in tech that's made, right? Facial recognition software misidentifies us left and right, and yet they're still implementing it. So this is critical, not just for Black people. This is critical for humanity. You can't, if, if, first of all, we can't be liberated unless white people liberate themselves from their own limiting beliefs. Everybody has to liberate for themselves from whatever the limitations are. Otherwise, we're always going to experience the violence, the anti-Blackness, the fear that people have, the guilt and the shame that we, that's what we're experiencing a lot in the United States. Guilt and shame and fear from other non-Black people <laughs> who projected onto us. 
So we need them to heal. And I think Afrofuturism is a beautiful place to do that. It does not blame. It does not try to shame you. It does, it, it brings you in through um, uh, fantasy. And it, as a result, it becomes seductive. And so you, you move into this world where it's centering blackness, but it, it might not be shocking anymore, if that makes sense, right? Because your, your, your personal reality hasn't shifted yet. Right. Mm -hmm. So therefore you can go into these other realities, alternate realities and experience blackness without bringing in all these other things, these biases. Um, or it might highlight a bias within you that you might not want to share with anyone. Right. But you can always grow and evolve and move through that. And, and I'm a big believer in that, you know, if you hold white supremacy, within you, you can heal that and get that out. You can move past that. It is possible. And I think Afrofuturism is probably one of the best methods to do it. I really love the way that, and thank you for all of that, but taking this space of imagination, a space for control to sort of recenter um, black bodies. And I say recenter because in a lot of our imaginations, you always start with who you are. But the problem of a lot of Western culture is that we're decentered in the mainstream. And so we're not part of the, so we all experience, black folks experience an internalized set of what the norms are. Non-black people um, also experience this internalized thing, but they're just positioned in a better place. Through this, um, the activity of social justice, where things are being done to acknowledge this, and then using Afrofuturism, I love how you say sort of this bringing it to a place where we can reimagine ourselves, where we can put ourselves there, and this is something for everyone. A lot of these discourses now talk about allyship, talk about what's the space for everyone. And we need to think that this Afrofuturism isn't just a black space, but it's a space for everybody to be thinking about these things. So thank you. This is really um, incredible. I love how our conversation was moving into sort of who Malcolm X is and what he was doing, because I think how we read about him, and I'm talking about a lot of the discourse that came out of the 1980s, and in that particular time, Mal the civil rights era is almost a generation behind us. We've got Martin Luther King is beginning to emerge as let's get a national holiday, this peaceful sit-ins, and this non-confrontation is where people, when I I was growing up, or at least in my circles in the 1980s and early 90s, where we wanted to be. I think now we're in a really wonderful space where Malcolm X is being reclaimed more. And, you know, Anthony Davis was doing this, Spike Lee was doing this, there were a lot of folks who were doing this. And to say that Malcolm X is not against white people, but he's trying to center and focus a place for Black achievement, reliance economically on each other you know, in my own thought of with the character is it boils down to X continuing to return to this idea that he is the product of his life. Um, you know, the opening aria of the character is you want the truth, but you don't want to know in which X walks through the litany of degradations that he and his family have been subject to and, and kind of coming to the point of saying, what would you expect me to be if all that I've ever experienced is harm at the, in this many, um, you know, many levels and contexts? This, I am the product of what you, this country, have done to me. So, having that existence, having X as this mirror who is constantly saying, hello, white America, hello world, I just am showing you what you have shown me. If you put that in this Afrofuturist context, it means that that mirror or that life can live and move and continue to be something that is reflective or engaged so that further people can be inspired to kind of dismantle the things that created a person that would even need to say that if that makes any sort of sense it means that that life does not just live in the past but we will continue to engage it through fantasy so that its import is something that can inspire and inform us presently and also hopefully forever 
Yes, it feels as though, and I don't want to trivialize what you're saying, but this production helps us see the Malcolm X that's relevant to each of us, how we have this mirror that's still being shown on us, how we can experience these things. I really appreciate your speaking from the position of getting into the character and creating him. I think Ingrid's larger view, because she so beautifully can speak about this world of Malcolm X and the, the antidote almost of how do we achieve it and get past only feeling the negative internalized elements of a white supremacist system. What is another system that we have? Definitely, and, and we can always create those new systems. And, uh, and I think both Malcolm X and Martin Luther King were trying to do that in a, in a deeper way, especially, you know, when you think about the Poor People's March, which um, they're bringing back, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of movement in, in really trying to bring that back into our present consciousness um, and not to not lose that. And uh, so it, it wasn't just about imagining, but also thinking about the economics strategically. How do we make this happen? Uh, that I really appreciate, actually, um, <clears throat> because you know we're constantly we're we're part of some of the issues that we're dealing with um, are have to do with the stress and strain of trying to survive, right? And um, it's sad that we're still in survival mode after all these years, that we're still dealing with a lot of the issues that Malcolm X and Martin Luther King were discussing. Like it's, it's kind of depressing when we think about it that yes, we've grown in some ways, but in a lot of ways we still you know, remain the same. Um, and so to come back to their agenda and come back to these systems that they were thinking about, I think it's very, very important. And now we have all this new technology that they didn't even know about that can actually protect us. Tulsa, Oklahoma uh, is one of my examples for why uh, I was working in blockchain technology and cryptocurrency. Uh, one, uh, there is a, 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 an application or a way of creating cooperative economics uh, through blockchain technology. And that's a big legacy for black Americans for, for growing wealth and generational wealth is through cooperative economics is the, has been the, the best method for us. Uh, and uh, so when I, when I present and I, I talk about this, elders ask me, well, how do you secure our money? Like, how do you make sure that they don't come and bomb us or, you know, <laughs> try and take your money and 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 that's why it's blockchain is interesting because it's digital and the records are can be um held in 20 million different places around the world so the security and it's immutable so the 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 security around it means something different for black americans than it does for the wider world we're thinking about how do we grow our wealth and not have it destroyed and taken from us again and that's why I think about blockchain technology and cryptocurrency. So my, my entry point to all of this is always to secure black futures. And, uh, and that has always been my center, similarly with Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. I love the way you've just pulled together this idea of the future and technology and different economic systems with sort of looking back, we probably wouldn't have, or hopefully the 1921 massacre in our current world with black, the black Twitter and with social media, this stuff couldn't just sort of happen and be hidden, but it would get out there. This is such a positive use of how our worlds were becoming more connected more broadly. I love, Ingrid, how you're able to sort of have this wider lens of how these earlier issues, which sadly keep happening, but can be, I don't want to say solved, but at least taken to a new level. There's more possibility when we have this, sort of harnessing it together. It feels as though Afrofuturism is giving us a lens for revisiting these issues and more possibilities are opening up there. From your experience in sharing um, your work with largely white audiences and what I'm trying to ground as what my experience is, you know, embodying this character in front of a largely white audience, how have you 
been able to, you know, have white people hold the idea that yes, it is Afrofuturism. And you spoke to this a bit, but yes, it is Afrofuturism, but by imagining futures that are not harmful to black people, we are actually imagining futures that are not harmful to the broader world. Meaning I'm I'm always trying to not allow white people to let themselves off the hook by saying, oh, wait, that's not about me. How do you continue to have them engage it as if it is actually as critical for their future as it is for ours? That's a tricky one. I mean, that's a very individual thing. We have to trust that the work is is doing the work. Mm -hmm. You know, um, because yes, sometimes I'll have a conversation with someone and um, the white person will be like, well, you know, that was great. And you can feel, you can feel them separating. Um, I, for the white audience that's listening now, I will say that when you're separating, you're actually separating from other humans. And I think that, um, we really, really need to get into the humanization of black bodies. Like I was reading about Ukraine today, um, about all the, the older people who are left and they feel alone and now they have to bury their children. And I was literally crying, I'm bawling. It's not, you know, I'm not Eastern European. I don't have Eastern European blood, but all I can imagine is my mother being in her seventies. I mean, how, how, how can you not relate? So that, that's my, my thing. I, I don't understand why we're not relating more regardless of color, culture, class. Like humans are humans <laughs> and we've all loved and connected with somebody and lost. And we know what pain feels like. We know what depression feels like, grief. It doesn't always have to come from people that look like you, that talk like you or have the same culture. There's just, and I think that that is probably the worst part about racism, um, any separatist, um, ideologies because there's just so much wisdom embedded in all of these places and within all of these people and to to decide not to include that wisdom in your own life is is actually limiting your own possibilities and the potential that you have and I'm not here for that I'm here to grow evolve and love and enjoy and and just be and uh and, I, and I'm hoping that people who aren't Black, when they enter the Afrofuture space, that they can connect just as deeply as I do when I enter other spaces that aren't Black. Beautifully said. Devon, as we're sort of moving to the end of our conversation, unfortunately, are there elements about you, Devon, Malcolm X, the man, the opera space and Afrofuture sort of pulling things together? And it could be any thoughts you've had um, also in reaction to um, or complimenting Ingrid's wonderful discussion about how there's, there's a humanity here that we all need to benefit from. Um, yeah, I mean, generally, I'm, I'm just excited to have the opportunity to be a physical body existing today that can be some node of showing this story from the past so that people sitting together in a present, you know, can hold the reality of what this incredible person did so that they can engage me as a human and see that the story I'm delivering is a vitally human one, so that as Ingrid says, you know, as the humanism of or humanizing of the X story held in the present might be a, an invitation for people to engage that for the future. My greatest hope is that people really take to heart what Ingrid has opened up as the broader um, reality of Afrofuturism. I mean, to me, I'm getting that, you know, ideals of civil rights movements, ideals of abolitionist thought can all beautifully fall under the umbrella of or in, in conversation with Afrofuturism. And that it's not necessarily something over here that we may not know about, but in fact is a broader way of thinking for us as a people to engage the world. So I'm hoping that this production of X framed this way is an invitation to see civil rights movements, abolitionist possibility, and humanizing of minority existences um, as 
uh, a unified movement towards a better future for all through Afrofuturism. Amen. Thank you, Ingrid, for opening up my eyes in that way. Absolutely. Thank you both so much. I'm really looking forward to this production. And I'm also looking forward to having this conversation sort of reshape how I think about where we are today. Ingrid, thank you so much for opening up these connections with the past and the future and the present to move us forward. Thank you, Devon Tynes. We are looking forward to seeing your Malcolm X, sort of the Detroit Opera Malcolm X with you in the title role. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you.